Welcome back to Gale Force Wins Season 4. And welcome to another edition of Gale Force Winds. And I got to tell you what a time we are having in Hungary. We are right now in the Buda Hills inside the castle. And it is amazing to be in conversation. This country is a place that you need to visit. You need to touch and feel this country once in your life. And I can assure you, you'll want to come back for more. I'm absolutely loving it here. Judah, what do you think? Well, I've never seen uh, so many inspiring people in my entire life than we did in the last week. So I'm all like pumped up for our next conversation with Nick. But Nick, why don't you start introducing yourself? <clears throat> well, first off, I, I would agree it's a great country to be in. Um, I don't know how I should really introduce myself. Go my right from is, the beginning, My name man. is Nick, uh, Nick Tonelli, um, and uh, I will always say Nick. I hate Nicholas. My dad calls me that, but... Uh, okay. Um, it, it's been an interesting story, an interesting trek. Uh, I was born in downtown Toronto, uh, Ava Road, right off the 400, and, uh, and then when I was four years old, we moved out to King City which is a tiny little small farmer's town, and it still really hasn't changed. It's, uh, uh, as I was saying before, it was 3,200 when I moved there. It's 3,800 now. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's been the same thing for a long time. And, and I, maybe that's one of the reasons why I'm, I haven't been back in a long time. I, I know that uh, Toronto and the region is, uh, is very dynamic and it's always changing, but I think there's a lot more to the rest of the world and, mm -hmm. and, and hence here in Budapest. Uh, when I was 14, uh, well, actually 13, post-communism, uh, my dad came here in 1990 uh, and, and so I would have been nine years old at the time and he, he started trying to, to, to work his business over here and the first year he was here just for a uh, a month or two and then the next year he was here for for six months and then the next year he was here for for more and then and then the final year before we moved here um he was only back home in canada for for maybe a week or two so mom and dad had left hungary to move to canada uh, no just uh, uh well my my dad's originally hungarian he was right. born here and uh, he he wasn't a 56er, but he was a 58er. Okay. <laughs> uh, he he didn't get his way, and so he decided that he'd he'd try and make his way uh, across Europe, and and he finally made his way to Canada. Um, <clears throat> and then my mother, she's uh, she's of uh, Filipino descendants, and uh, and she made her way to Toronto, just like uh, uh, everybody was back <laughs> you know, in the day. Uh, they they met. It was love. <laughs> they um, met in Toronto. Yeah, they met in Toronto. Right. Um, my my mom was a beauty queen. My dad was a, uh, a successful businessman, and uh, I guess they basically hit it off. And uh, and then my sister, and then I came. <clears throat> <laughs> what business was your dad in? I uh, he's he's in logistics, freight forwarding, shipping okay. and handling cargo. Okay. And. Uh, uh, According to him, it wasn't his dream job, but yeah. he was able to be next to uh, airplanes, which is what his passion is. Okay. And, uh, and so he was by the airport, and he was always able to, to, to be around the big jets, and, and, uh, and, and he made a, a thing of himself. He was, right. he was successful both in Canada and both over here as well. Um, he definitely has a drive that, that most do not, um, myself included. Yeah. Um, I, I like to think that, that I do have drive, but, but he's, he's something totally different. He's a machine. Yes, de definitely, <laughs> definitely. Um, and, and so I, I ended up moving here. I would say that I ended up getting dragged here. Okay. Uh, 13, just entering high school. Disruptive, right? To uh, leave the Canadian system. But, and that's the exact thing. Right. So it, it was, I had just started to you know come into my own not just as a canadian but as as a boy as mm -hmm. a 13 year old boy I, I had my first year in high school um i had started school a little bit earlier having yeah. a first year at, at 13. uh and uh i i, I really didn't want to go right and so what was life in canada like 
Well, life in Canada for me was a little bit difficult, if, if I'll be honest, um, which I guess yeah. I am being yeah. honest. <laughs> um, I, I was picked on a lot. I was bullied a lot. Okay. It didn't matter where I went. I was always an outcast. I was always different. I, although I'm three shades lighter than I used to be, I was picked on for the color of my skin. I was picked on for the background of my parents. I was picked on because I wasn't middle class, I was upper class, or at least the region or the area that we were growing up in. It was little estates and, and yeah. that sort of thing. But I didn't feel that. My dad being your, your typical Hungarian and my mother being rather typically Filipina, it wasn't like they're just buying everything for us. For instance, we didn't have cable, we didn't have satellite. Right. We had three TV channels. One of them were, or two of them were American. And it was just that, you know, that, that little yeah, antenna yeah. on the top of the roof that yeah. you had to turn a dial to, <laughs> to, to get it done. So we weren't spoiled. It wasn't that typical thing. But of course, the, the view of who I was and then add to that that I lived in King City and then the, the school that I was in uh, was in Aurora. So that was another change that they were all right around the school. Mm -hmm. And then I went to French Immersion and it was an English school. Right. And so the, there were four classes of 40 students. Three of them were 50-50 girl-boy and then the fourth one was a French Immersion class. Right which had 40 students, but only three of them were boys. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, you find your your niche on how to pick on that kid about right. why he's he's in a class full of girls yeah. and he comes from a different place. Yeah. And then, uh, you know... A lot of focal points there, right? A lot of focal yeah. points. I, the big bus couldn't pick us up because we were on a snowy hill, so right. they sent me on a short bus. Right, yeah. Pick on and on, on it goes, yeah. Exactly, like yeah. every little thing right. that you could think of, I was literally in a fist fight every day oh my God. i had my own little black binder yeah and and i was on uh you know first name basis with the principal yeah because he knew that uh that it wasn't me that was starting it it was right. just me that was finishing it right yeah, yeah um i just i didn't let people pick on me okay and uh that was partially my dad's training or yeah. whatever uh and and so Canada to me was always a mixed bag. I I love Canada. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want to leave. That that that's for sure. But if I look back at my past, uh, the amount that I got picked on, I wouldn't want that for my kids. Right. And and now that I have two, I can make the decision. Right. And uh, well, next to that, I. But I, what I was going to, sorry for uh, sorry. interrupting, but what I was going to say that we're talking about the 1980s, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's probably Canada back then, Newfoundland for sure, that was less colorful and less uh, multicultural and less open maybe. Interestingly it's, enough, I, I don't think it was the people by region except the very small regionality of of the suburbs so it was a, a lot of middle class uh kids that had a lot to prove mm -hmm. and i find that it's still somewhat the same way although i haven't been back in a long time i still have friends that are there i still have my cousins um that are there and and it was one of these uh i don't know abnormalities you you, you catch somebody you look yeah. at them in the eyes and you do that once and that's okay and then you catch them mm. in the eyes a second time and they're like what yeah and you don't do that in toronto because right. if you do that in toronto you can get in trouble right. but when you're in the suburbs lots of people have a lot of stuff to prove right but, and, and it's a very from anybody who's not experienced that suburban ontario life i mean it is something to see i mean every house is identical most yeah. of the cars are identical it's, yeah it is there's a there was a cutter living a cookie cutter living right there's a great canadian rock band by the name of rush who comes from not far from there and they wrote a really famous song called subdivisions and one of the lines <laughs> in that song and that song is conform or be cast out that is a very powerful statement of that style of living. And it's exactly what you describe, right? Conform or be cast out. Yeah. And you were not in that model, no, no, right? No, it wasn't. I mean, I never took it to heart. Yeah. I, I, it, it wasn't, 
yes, I fought my way out of what I needed to fight my way out of, but it was never hatred towards the other right. people. It was yeah. never resentment towards them. I figured they were doing it because they were doing it. It is just kind of what it is. Right. But it, it <clears throat> that's why it's it's still positive as much as it is negative. I never, I never, yeah. it's not that I, I hated that. It, it was just something else to, to work through, something else to struggle yeah, of through. Course. Obviously, it must have made me stronger. Yeah. It, 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 it's a bit of a foundation there. Yeah. As complicated as it was, it yeah. forms you who you are today, right? Okay, so you... But I, so I was a sportsman. Right. I, what did you I, play? I, well, gymnastics was my main sport. Okay. Um, I like to say that I was training for the Olympics. Yeah. I don't know how realistic that was, but, uh, but I was constantly in the top. I did go to Canadian nationals and wow. international competitions. And my, my one rival, and you cannot make a name like this up, I'm going to shout him out, Joseph Ego. <laughs> so, Joseph Ego. Joseph Ego. <laughs> um, he was always number one. If, if he wasn't at the competition, I was. Right. So uh, he was my, my Filipino mixed companion, and he was always the best, and, and I appreciate him for, for pulling me forward. But, uh, but, but so that just meant that I was on track and field. I did running sports. I did the sprints. I did the long distance. I did all of the throwing sports, uh, discus, shot put, javelin. I went to Canadian Nationals for discus. I did high jump. I did long jump. I did everything. I was on the basketball team, the uh, the, the volleyball team. Uh, we did rugby. You name it, I was there. Uh, soccer, for instance, as well. I rode horses. I did everything. And I really had a life that was established there, or at least as a 13-year-old kid, that's what I felt. Right. And then suddenly it was, oh, you're coming here. I hated it. <laughs> Tell me about hated that it. first couple of years here. Um, the first year is probably the most interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, my dad told me when we got here that uh, if I'm bad enough, that he'll send me back to Canada to a military school. Oh. And I forget which academy was in the, the Aurora Newmarket region. It was a boys' military academy. Yeah. And, and I was vouching for that. That's, <laughs> I did everything to be shipped not. back to Canada. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'll leave those stories for off camera. <laughs> sure. <yeah. laughs> um, but uh, I, I, I really, I tried hard. I fought back. Um, I did everything I could so that my dad would send me back. And ultimately, uh, a girl is what saved everything. Um, she was a, uh, a Croatian, half Hungarian, half Croatian. A classmate of mine and I ended up getting a girlfriend and I calmed down because I didn't that, that's when it was okay I don't want to be sent back anymore right. and and it gave me a reason to stay <laughs> um, and then it gave me a reason to start learning the language I was initially put into a Hungarian curriculum English language school where they just translated everything mm -hmm. um, it was an interesting school mm -hmm. university teachers teaching high school students right not really the patients that they need um, regularly teachers were crying um, the kids uh, you know richer Hungarians uh, that, that spoke English or they wanted their kids to speak English so yeah. lots of people with a lot of silver spoons and uh, uh, a lot of entitlement and, yeah. and a lot of uh, uh, naughtiness yeah. just really bad things uh, everything you can think of right <laughs> um, did the uh, bullying continue it, or? It, it didn't actually what what uh, the interesting thing was is in in grade seven i was so i was the shortest the skinniest and one of the darkest in 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 the school and it was i was a perfect target to be picked on i, I don't blame them for mm -hmm. it i'm sure they wouldn't be like that anymore yeah but uh <clears throat> Um, the last year I, is when I had my growth spurt. And so I, my summer training was six, seven days a week, uh, six to eight hours a day. And, and it was super intense. I used to bike 20 kilometers to, to get to the gym and then do my training and then bike 20 kilometers back. 
Whoa. And w one day, close to the start of school, I was on my way down my regular route, which went by the school, and a group of those boys that used to bully me, uh, they, they, they kind of, you know, pulled me over and, and me worrying the ramifications of if me not stopping what would happen when I got to school, I, I pulled over and then there was, uh, uh, I'm sure there might have been more, but there was one uh, um, uh, 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 black kid in the school mm -hmm. and, and we had this unspoken something. So he, he used to protect me. Nobody picked on him. Uh, he was part of the English grade. He grew up with everybody, but, mm. but you know, we were all standing there. I'm sitting on my bike and they're all surrounding me. And, and they said, you know, Nick, just get off your bike. And I, no, I don't reluctantly. Want to. Like, like, re like yeah. I really didn't want to. Yeah. And then he looks at me and he's like, just, you know, get off your bike. And, and, and I'm like, okay, if, if he's saying that, then, then maybe they're, they're not looking to beat me up right now. Maybe they're just looking to talk or something. And whereas it used to be that I was up to about here on them, I stood up and they were all up to about here on me. And plus all the summer conditioning and training meant that I was a lot bigger than them and I had my <laughs> growth spurt. So they stopped picking on me. And that year I ended up with the you know stereotype blonde hair blue eyed popular girl in in school in grade eight um she broke my heart in grade nine yeah <laughs> but uh but but yeah then then i went to uh to, to high school and uh i had my first year with the knowledge that nothing mattered uh, my dad had told me that it doesn't matter what i do in school they're definitely going to be putting me back a year my, my math, my language, my, my history, my everything isn't good enough for the Hungarian system. So I was taking uh, tutoring, uh, first year university math, um, prep courses, and it was, it was pretty intense. Then, uh, you know, after a, a very emotional goodbye with, with all of my friends, I, I finally made it over here and, and then I, I had to take that, uh, the, the entrance exam mm -hmm. and, and yeah, they set me back. Right. It didn't matter why. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I didn't ace the mass test, but yeah. I did pass it. And then, and then like, how did you get to that? And I said, I, I did this. And I'm like, we don't do that here. <laughs> I said, but I got the answer. I got the answer. Yeah. Like, but we don't do it like that yeah. here. Um, okay. Yeah. You know, so, uh, so, so you're, the first year was rough. You the, meet this girl. The first year was rough, yeah. You meet this girl. She turns things around. Yeah. Uh, Croatian girl. Did she speak English or did you? Uh, ki kind of. Yeah. Um, it, she spoke English well enough that we could communicate. Right. Um, obviously, uh, everybody was, m not everybody, but most people were learning English in that school. Right. Uh, but it was English based, so, so it, it was conversational. Right. A little bit broken, a little bit with an accent. Um, so things start to turn around then. They, they did start to turn around. Yeah. They, they slowly got better. It, it, I became the bully of bullies in high school. So right. because I was always picked on, um, whenever I saw somebody picking on somebody else, then I would always give back to them what they gave right. to the other. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the attitude I had. Right. But then also when I moved here, I was, I was a new person. I was different. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to do that. I guess it was me, my Canadian self. My Canadian self was, was I wanted to make everybody happy. I wanted to appease everyone and everything. And somebody said, I'm thirsty and I'd go get them a drink. Mm. Not because I asked for one, just because they were thirsty. And, and then I came here and it wasn't that I didn't care about that anymore, but the, the mindset that I had from that point on is that I am me. If you don't like me, that's your loss and I don't care. And so, I, I ended up amassing a, a group of friends, some from every school that there was, and a couple of us who, <clears throat> I mean, North American schools or English speaking schools being as small as they are in Budapest or as small as they were, because they're much bigger now, uh, it was a very tight knit community, but pre me and my group of friends, they were still kind of separated. And then, and then, then I had a friend from this school and a friend from that school, and we started bringing everyone together. And then we 
kind of ruled the city type of thing. <laughs> we, we had that feeling. Yeah. So the first, the first couple of years that we were here, there's a huge club here called Morrison's. Um, I was in the first Morrison's when I was 13 years old. And I told everybody that I was 18. Uh, it was my 18th birthday and everybody was buying me drinks. So that's how everything kind of started when I first came here on my trip. And when I went to that school, <clears throat> the owner of Morrison's was uh, one of our schoolmates. Okay. Which meant that from a very young age, we were able to get into the clubs. Um, apart from the fact that they didn't have at that time you know, restrictions, yes. <laughs> let's call it. If you had enough money and, and if you looked good enough, then, then they would definitely let you but into you pretty much any club. Um, especially being a foreigner that, that, that gave you that, that excess of uh, privilege. Um, most of the, the foreigners that were here were either diplomats or, or some rich businessman's yeah. children, which meant that uh, that afforded you, uh, again, another layer, another two layers of, of privilege and being able to do things and go places that, that other people weren't able to. <clears throat> and uh, and when I f we really felt like we, we kind of ruled the city. So everybody's parents being a little bit of something, and then suddenly you have a, a hundred kids who have influential parents that are getting together. Now that doesn't mean that we got a lot of things. Some of the kids did, but just the idea of, of being this niche in a very small, mm. or at the time, what was a very small group of expats was liberating. Right, right. And so that was in high school, right? That was in high so school. So we're talking about the mid 1990s. Yeah, 94. 94. Till, till, till 99. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, and the first two years was in one school, and then I went to another school, uh, which was Greater Grace Christian Academy. Um, I, not much to say about uh, missionary schools in general. Mm. Religion is fine, but when that's your entire mission, then that uh, yeah. um, excuse things. It, it 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 puts a different twist on yep. things, yeah. and uh, I'm infamous <laughs> from that school. I've been scrubbed from all history. Um, <laughs> I, I've 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 noticed that, uh, which is it's it's not a problem. I I was a disturber. That, that's for sure. Did you continue? I, I can understand why. I mean, you, as you described the background, I can yeah. I can kind of get it. Um, did you continue the athletics all through this journey? I I tried, but but ultimately I, I didn't. When right. I first came to Hungary, I was put into uh, I, I went to athletics. I stopped gymnastics. I stopped martial arts. I stopped riding horses and everything else. And and I I was here in Hungary and I said, you know what, I wanted to do discus because I, I went to Canadian Nationals and, and I thought I'd be really good at it. And then they said, you need to do shot put. I did it for a month or two. Yeah. And then I was like, yeah, no. And then I became a snowboarder. <clears throat> So you started snowboarding here? No, I started snowboarding there, but this well, that was kind of my right. claim to glory over here where... Were there a lot of people snowboarding there? Here? No. Right. And okay. that was kind of the thing. So my, my first winter here, uh, one of my best friends was also Canadian. Uh, he was uh, a Calgarian-born uh, Hungarian descendant, uh, lad, chap, whatever. Yeah. Um, and his uncle had a, uh, a ski shop. Okay. where they were selling snowboards. And the first year that I was here, they had one of these uh, um, scaffolding jumps that were set up for freestyle. And my first competition, I placed third. And wow. I was 14 years old. And, and it was like... You know, and where was this? Yeah. In Oh, in, Buda Square. in Budapest. In Budapest, they set up a, a huge jump. The professionals were obviously... They had their 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 pro uh, pro circuit, and I, I wasn't there yet. But uh, um, they I, I saw this jump that was set up right behind Hero Square on the on the the skating rink that yeah. was over there, and and I was like I, I have to do that. I I don't know what it is. I don't know why, but I have to do that. <laughs> 
And so we went over and uh, <clears throat> we brought our snowboards and we brought our gear and we're like, hey, can, can we jump? And I didn't speak the language at all. My, my Hungarian friend did. Uh, and he went over there and, and then he comes back and he tosses me a jersey. And I'm like, what's this? He's like, well, you have three <laughs> practice jumps. I'm like, practice for what? The competition. That's the only way you can do. So I've entered you and, and myself and, and we're going we're gonna to go do that. And so it was, it was uh, high jump was the first competition, then freestyle was the next. I didn't do so well in the freestyle at first. Yeah. But, but then, then I continued on to, I guess, what would we consider the pro circuit. <laughs> um, and I was one of the first full sponsored snowboarders uh, in, in Hungary. And uh, I forget the name of the, the base company, but uh, Airwalk Snowboards. They, uh, they, they gave me a full sponsorship and they, they geared me up and gave me money to, to go to competitions. <laughs> and, and as a kid, that was a dream. 100%. Yeah. Uh, the same year that the double front flip uh, won the X Games and the Olympics, that's the same year that I was able to do it. Wow. But it was here in Hungary. Yeah. Um, but then I blew my knee out. So. Okay. That was... Okay, so <laughs> athletics takes a bit of a shift, and that's yeah. kind of fun, and academically well, takes a bit of a shift. Well, g gymnastics allowed me to do a lot of things, sure, yeah. um, just knowing yeah. how my body was, uh, and, and, and the culture. Right. So, you know how Toronto is. Yeah. You said you were in the, in the region. Yep. Um, you constantly have every language around you. Right. Uh, I've never had a problem learning languages. Mm -hmm. I would assume that that's why, or I would attest to right. that being the reason yeah. behind it. I, my mom's colleagues were Indian, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, yeah. um, Middle Eastern, European, you name it, and every language was always around. Right. So what language did you speak at home? English and French. English, French? Just that. No Hungarian? No, no Hungarian. On the weekends, we got to uh, occasionally hear Good Morning Vietnam, uh, in Hungarian because my dad, uh, my weekends were, we would usually have dim sum with uh, the Filipino side. Okay. And then after that, we were close enough to Toronto that we would head into the downtown where my Hungarian cousins were and my Hungarian aunts. And then we would have dinner with them. And, and typically on the weekends, I would hear that, that Yo get Vietnam. <laughs> you know, you've heard it. Um, and, and then that's when we were like, okay, we're going to the basement. So, so my, that was my Hungarian, was, right. was listening to them. I, I didn't know the language when I came here. I couldn't even count to 10. Right. Um, my Hungarian teacher was my German teacher, and uh, they didn't allow me into French because my French was too good. Yeah. And the Hungarian German teacher didn't speak English. Okay. <laughs> So he was teaching me Hungarian and German and German and Hungarian. And <laughs> exactly. Wow. Um, my sister and I were the only two in the beginner level because everybody else had some sort of Hungarian background. And uh, after the first year, which we learned nothing, um, maybe to count to 10, I would say. Um, and the typical, how are you? And good morning. And, and let's call it 10 short phrases that, that, that you, could, you could simply say on the street. That was about it. And he said, uh, he got one of our friends, my girlfriend actually, yeah. uh, to translate saying that uh, there is no back, there's only forward because there is no class behind you. So you pass <laughs> with a two, <laughs> so that's like a D. Yeah. Um, and, and we'll see how it works the next year. And the next year wasn't any better um, because of him, but it was better because of us. By right. then, my sister had a sure. boyfriend, I had a girlfriend, and, uh, and, and that was part of learning the language where people would mess with us. Right. Um, they, you know, just the things that they were saying or, or being a part of the, the, the laughter. Everybody's laughing at something and you want to know what's so what's funny. What's going on, you're, yeah. Exactly, you're in a yeah. group of 10, 15 people and, and they say something and you're yeah. just like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great, yeah. Hey. So, so then it was, well, what, what happened and what, what did they say? And then I heard this person saying right. this and, and pretty quickly we both, <clears throat> if you try, then you can do these things. And <clears throat> I know a lot of people say that Hungarian is 
the hardest language in the world to learn next to or 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 you know just as hard as Japanese right I guess I'll agree I'm not a linguist but I think if you put some time and effort into it like any other language you can learn it I know many people that did because they wanted to and I also know many people that were here for 15 20 years and they would struggle to order at McDonald's right but that was their life yeah is it was I'm definitely going to be leaving why am I going to right. I have foreigners around me I can speak English mm -hmm. and so there's there's really no point Academically, after high school, did you stay? Did, did you did you do anything beyond that, or, or what, what was life then? I, I took a what are they a gap year? Okay. I took a gap year. Um, my parents weren't too happy about it, but <laughs> I I never felt that school was that important to me. So, right. for instance, even in high school, my sister went to the the American International School. Yeah. I didn't want my parents to spend that money on yeah, me, yeah. so I said. Let, let, let's go to the cheaper one. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I, I did uh, the, the, the PSATs, um, and, and uh, I, I got in the top 10th percentile, uh, even though I didn't know that it was supposed to be the test. Right. Uh, to the surprise of the entire school, because I'm a horrible student. Right. I, I don't do homework. I, I never did anything. Um, I came in for the tests and I passed all the tests. I, I just, I, I'm not that type of, right, yeah. uh, of learner. 100%. And, uh, um, where did the gap year take you? Nowhere. No, you stayed just, just, just here, yeah. just, just figuring out, I guess more of who I was, more mm -hmm. of what I wanted. Right. Um, and then, and then the decision came where I'd, I'd go to university in Calgary. I was accepted into the University of Calgary, but I ended up going to SAIT instead because they had a cheaper program. Right. Um, at the time, it was accredited, and then midterm, they lost their accreditation oh. for the, the, the business program. So as much as I wanted a BA, I ended up with an associate's. Okay. Um, and uh, l lots of complications, not, not any fault of the school yeah. themselves, but... but uh, um, like my, my last year that I was there was for three classes that my coordinator at the time just missed out on. Right. So I was supposed to graduate. I went to the ceremony and everything, but I didn't actually get my paper because I had business math 101 right. or something like that, yeah, yeah. that, that, that was left over. And so I had to take some night schooling to do that. But it, it was hard moving again, yeah, especially to a place and why why did you choose alberta is it the snowboarding that brought you out partially the snowboarding <laughs> because i you know it, it's one of the best places yeah, in the world to to, to to go but uh i love my dad yeah <laughs> so uh apart from you know any resentments that I might have over the childhood, he's very business oriented. Yeah, yeah. So family wasn't really a priority for him. Mm -hmm. And, and I could feel that as a kid mm -hmm. and growing up, it, it ended up being kind of a big F you to, yeah. to, to him. Just I'm out of here. I'm it, it's, yeah. it's, it's let me find the furthest place. Like right. I wanted to go to Canada. I knew, I always told myself that, that, that Hungary is temporary and Canada is my next step and I'm definitely going to be moving back. Yeah. I did fall in love with Hungary while I was here. Yeah. It was my second year that, that opened me up to what the, the city had and what the country had and its proximity to the rest of Europe. It's, I mean, it's right in the center. It's, it's such an amazing place to be. And so why choose a place that's as remote as Calgary? Because of that. <laughs> so I lived there on and off. So, I mean, I, I took vacations back to Budapest, right. um, uh, but I was there for a total of about seven years. Okay. And in that seven year span, my mother came for a total of 24 hours. Okay. That was the only person that came and saw me. And that was the point. Yeah. Was to, to say, you know, I'm off to do my thing. Yeah. Look, dad, I can, I can be my own I man can be as your well. Person. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, they, they helped me the first year that I was there, yeah. obviously. Well, not obviously, but yeah. thankfully. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so what did you do besides university in Calgary? 
you going to university, you're snowboarding. Having fun. Having, having fun. fun, yeah. It's a um, vibrant city, right? It, it, it yeah. is. It was interesting moving there. Cause yeah. When I first moved there, it, it, uh, it was much less metropolitan. Right. <laughs> so it was <clears throat> when, when we were nigh 2000. Yeah. This is when I moved there, 2000, right. 2001. Uh, so it was uh, very, very kind of cowboyish. Yep. Uh, not so many minorities. Nope. Not, not, uh, not, not Toronto. No, definitely not Toronto. Yep. Um, but I brought my own little flair, yep. my own little pizzazz. You know, it was, it was kind of the automatic, because I'm not wearing a jersey, then, then who are you? Where are you from? the first impression to everybody was, uh, well, he must be gay mm. because I didn't wear a jersey and a baseball cap. Right. And, and it was no. Well, you would have Budapest flair about you. And no, no, I just had flair about me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's B Budapest flair. I mean, yeah, definitely it gave, you know, as I said before, that I, it became that I didn't care. Right. Yeah. But I, I, I was an attention seeker. That that's what it was. So I, the first car that I bought, it was uh, one of these typical uh, custom, uh, uh, you know, body kits cool. and rims. And it was the only copper orange car. And I had orange pants and orange sunglasses. You wanted to, match to stand it. out in Calgary. I, I wanted to stand out everywhere. Right. Um, it was the same thing here. I was always being very flamboyant or, or yeah. very loud just, right. just my personality was, yeah. was kind of loud and uh, I showed up to a club um, called Cowboys mm -hmm. uh, my first year there uh, I mean there, there's Cowboys and Spurs and Ranchmans and 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 I went to Cowboys uh, and there was a big line oh my mistake outlaws that's the one that it was, the really big one. And it was, it, there, there was a huge line of everybody waiting. It was cold, it was winter time. And, and I, from a friend, I ended up getting like this, uh, my Korean friend who brought it back, I thought it was just a joke, but the, you know, the poofy jackets, yeah, yeah. Uh, the sleeping bag jackets. Yep. Well, he brought one that was this uh, uh, like shiny white. Like this, that plastic shine. I, I like a lac. Yeah, like I, I don't know I, what. I can visualize it. Were you rolling up in the or in the? Oh no, no. I, I took a, a black boa and a white boa, and I spun them together, and I sewed them onto the collar, and it came all the way down, all the way over here. So I had a shiny white jacket with a black and white boa that I showed up just to to you know pick at the people that were at outlaws, at, exactly at outlaws <laughs> at the at the cowboy style type of thing. And it, but it turns out that that's what Kid Rock was wearing at the time. Um, and so they picked me out from the back of the line and they're like, you, <laughs> I'm like, what are you kicking me out? Because then they were famously, yeah. the Calgary was famous yeah. for removing people from, you know, the, yeah. the unwanted. And they're like, you come to the front. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So our, our group went in and, and we, we had a blast Good. in, in Calgary. It, uh, I, I didn't feel any different uh, in Calgary than I did anywhere else in the world. Right. In Toronto, it was always, where are you from? Um, my mother was very particular about not using filler words like, you know, mm. I, I try not to. You, you, you'll hear it come out yeah. occasionally, but uh, I was scolded yeah. that, that speak a little bit slower so that you know what you're trying to say and, and stop using filler words. And, and so in Toronto, I was asked regularly, where are you from? Like, you're, you're obviously not from here. Well, but I am. Uh, when I moved to Budapest, obviously I wasn't from here. And then when I moved to Calgary, I didn't dress like them. I didn't look like them. I didn't sound like them. So it's, where are you from? I'm Canadian. No, but where are you from? <laughs> and uh, apparently now that's kind of a divisive question. Right. If you ask somebody where... It wasn't then, yeah. It, it wasn't then. Um, and... Just to touch on that, I'm proud that I'm, I'm mixed. I'm right. proud that I'm a foreigner. I'm proud that, that it, it, I think it, it, it starts a question. Mm -hmm. it, it starts a conversation to, to be able to ask, where are you from? Right. 
though I, I do I do totally and I fully understand the <clears throat> the hardships that some people may have may have gone through with a line of questioning like that. Yeah. Um, specifically, even after high school um, and after university, I had a friend here in Budapest. She was obviously Asian. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, my, my mother's Malay, she's from the Philippines. You can, you know, if you're used to it or if you've been there many times, then, then you can pick it out. And I could pick out that she was Malay. So, but she wasn't Filipina. Right. And so I asked her, you know, where are you from? And, and she was part of our group of friends. So I didn't think it was going to be uh, anything insulting or anything divisive. And she, she looks at me and she's like, I'm Hungarian. Just to explain, both of her parents are from her original country. Right. But she was born here. Born here. And I totally understand that feeling that she is Hungarian. Yeah. But then, of course, I was being pushy, but I, I'm Hungarian too. I also have yeah. a passport. I also have yeah. my identification, but I also have a background. So where are you from? Right. And she said, I'm Hungarian. Right. And she was rather annoyed, perturbed, yeah. and, and then we weren't really friends for quite a long time. Right. She wouldn't even look at me after that. Yeah. Um, and I can just imagine that her being born here at the time that she was, because we were similar in age, that she had a lot of that where, where she was Hungarian. She had identified as Hungarian, right. but she constantly got the question, had to, where are yeah, you from? 100%. You can understand that for sure. Now, a heck of a lead up, man. <laughs> like sorry. what an interesting I, sorry. what an interesting journey you had. I can I can relate to that yeah. on so many levels and especially with my kids because they were born in Hungary. Uh, we moved to Canada when they were little and we moved back, so we're splitting our time between Canada and Hungary. So their identity is kind of this complex as it can be. Right. hundred percent. I bet. And um, so what a great story. <laughs> like I can, I have a really good appreciation for you as a person. And uh, wow. I mean, what, what, a, what, a, what a journey you've taken us on to get us. What are you doing in the moment? Explain to us what you're doing right now in Hungary. Well, I, I got lost for a while. Um, you know, after Calgary, it was back to Hungary, and then after that, it was I moved to uh, Bali, Indonesia, for a little bit uh, um, to work and to clear my mind, and then I came back here. Um, this time voluntarily. Th this time voluntarily. Actually, I moved. This is my fifth time moving here, and and apart from the first time, the other four were all voluntary because I I fell in love with the place. I I. I honestly, genuinely think that this is one of the best places that uh, the most I can say when, when Hungarians ask me, but why Hungary? Why not Canada? Because a lot of Hungarians want to move, mm -hmm. but they want to move because this is their backyard. Yeah. When you grow up somewhere, you take know, it for granted. Exactly. But it's not just take it for granted. You get bored and you want to leave. Right. And so why wouldn't you want to be in Canada? And, and it's because I feel at home here too. I haven't been back to Toronto in 18 years. I haven't been back to Canada in 12 years. The last time was Montreal. Mm -hmm. um, that was working for, for my dad at the time on a business trip. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then uh, we had a falling out and that's when I moved to Bali. And at the time I had a girlfriend and we broke up because I needed some, some time to figure myself out. Uh, I, I, I disappeared for I don't know, six, seven months or something yeah. like that. And then that was the final decision. The last time I moved here was, it wasn't for a girl, um, because uh, my, my wife, uh, who is now my wife, yeah. uh, Jolfi, uh, it was for her. And I, I moved back for the life, for the everything. Uh, one of, how should I say? I, I read a study that one of Hungary's biggest problem is brain drain. Uh, right. There's a lot of very smart people, a lot of very good schools that are in Hungary and Budapest in particular, but also in Pech and Debrecen. Um, and they, they come here, they get their education because education is free. Um, one of the benefits of, yeah. of uh, slight socialism. 
and and then they can't make their way as well as they can somewhere else. So they they go to Canada, they go to Hungary, they go somewhere else. And and both my wife and I at a similar point in our lives, we decided that we wanted to bring our our knowledge and our experiences back to Hungary to see whether or not we could be a benefit to society. Um, in the meantime, I had this slight falling out. I had to go and find myself, and then and then it was back to Hungary. Wow! And this was eight years ago now. So, it and, was. And now you have two beautiful boys. It was back, and it was, you know, continuation of the love with the the understanding that she is going to be the one for me, and uh, and then since then it's been uh, two children and and two dogs uh, <laughs> later. And um, when we decided that we wanted to have kids, I, I've always been sales, professional sales, uh, business administration, management major, okay, but but what I do is is talk. Right. I, I've always had uh, relationship development. Uh, exactly. Development, yeah. yeah, that's always. I can see why. It's, it's <laughs> been a point. Thank you. Um, I I thought it was a forte of mine. That's why I went into sales. Yeah. Um, and and I I would say that I was successful enough, or at least the feeling of success was, mm. was there. Um, and and then I I came back here and. Being in sales, especially international sales, it, it tends to pull you away. And my dad was always pulled away from the family, and I didn't want that to happen mm -hmm. with me and, and my kids, whether or not, I mean, at the time, I didn't know there would be two boys. Right. Um, I wanted to be more of the, the father rather than the, the, the breadwinner. Right. I guess that would be the right That's word. great. Yeah, great way to put it. Um, so, uh, I was working for a Hungarian company who dealt with, uh, these 3d mapping, uh, mixed with, uh, dancing girls. And it was taking me abroad with, with, uh, a whole bunch of dancing girls. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> and, and I thought that, that, uh, I'm sure my wife also thought as well that, that maybe uh, she was just my girlfriend at the time that, yeah. that maybe maybe if we're going to be starting kids, that's not really the life for me. Right. Uh, and, and I didn't, I really didn't want that. Yeah. So when we were discussing what we were doing, my, my wife was a uh, project manager at the time, which allotted her uh, in the IT industry and it allotted her a lot of, uh, home time. Uh, so we, we decided that I would be the one to, to stop working okay. and, and find some other way to continue the same life that we have and the same standard of living without me constantly being away and on the road and, and also right. plus the stress of being in sales. I mean, you know how that is. It's, it's hard to brush it off at the end of the day, but, but regardless. So, so I, I quit and, uh, and we decided to have kids. Uh, we wanted to have one last vacation and one last big bang uh, <laughs> in, in Amsterdam. Uh, we, we went to the Philippines to, to visit some family and we went with two and came back three. And so <laughs> Amsterdam never happened. But uh, um, and then that was a point where it was, OK, now this is real. Now this is life. Right. And I still don't take it that much more seriously, but, <laughs> no. but I had to take it more seriously. Right, of course, yeah. of course, the responsibility. There's a responsibility right? here, right? Different. So uh, I I invested in a property, and uh, I lucked out, and of course, you know, being in sales, negotiating skills helped uh, secure a really nice property downtown. I uh, built and designed it uh, in collaboration with one of my best friends, who's uh, an award-winning uh, um, industrial designer. But we put in a lot of ideas that were were different, and we made it specifically for the short-term rental market, Airbnb. I yeah. don't want to. Can't say that here yet. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, anyways, okay. uh, short-term rental market yeah, yeah. is what we we developed the property for. Uh, but we didn't know if we were going to get the, the permits. Okay. And so it's also good enough for long term. And it took 10 months to get on our name because there were some complications with the paperwork. Right. And then the building process took uh, two, three times as long as we were planning. 
But finally, we were able to launch, and they liked it so much that I had interior <laughs> designers and architects saying, wow, giving us personal feedback. They really enjoyed it. And that allotted us a, a base income, a passive income, where I was able to start working on other things. And while I was building that, we, I'm, I'm a stickler for detail, and I wanted a particular type of feeling for it. And I happened to have ordered in some plugs and switches from abroad that uh, they, they were black and uh, it was uh, um, brushed aluminum and, and they just looked really different. Right. And and so they look really different, like that white puffy jacket and the two boas yeah. in the back of the lineup. Again, where you're going, yeah, everything that I do, everything you do. I, the the car is custom, yeah. the motorcycle is custom. Yeah. I've designed jackets and bags, and and I just like to have everything different, yeah. or at least a little bit different, sure. um, original. Yeah, uh, it doesn't mean that everybody likes it, but but I like it. Yeah. Um, and it was the same thing with that place. I decided that I'd make it something that I like versus something that other people like. We kept it very minimal. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and during the design process, when we ordered these switches, I saw them and I was like, you know what? These are really good. And I built a business around it. Wow. Um, and the business was going rather well. Same with the, uh, the, the short-term rentals. And then COVID hit. <laughs> yeah obviously killed short-term rentals, yeah. um, uh, killed the, the development market. Uh, uh, our, our business took a dive, but we kept it alive and, and it's slowly on its way back up. Wow. But during COVID, I needed to find something to do. And so I borrowed an idea and I started producing and manufacturing baby toys. <laughs> Again, I know <laughs> it's, it, it's it's rather off, but it's a uh, um, surgical stainless steel uh, teething rattle uh, fidget toy for babies. We ended up getting it uh, um, to certified. Wow. Uh, sorry, it's European certified. Yeah. The company that did it happened to be Tooth, but there are multiple companies that right. do this. Um, and we're we're currently trying to launch that. So we're we're just coming out of. I don't want to say just, it's been a year now, but uh, we're, we're out of the pandemic. And and for those two, two and a half years of lockdown, that was my project. That was your project. Uh, tell me, how easy is it to do business in Hungary and build um, a business? I mean, clearly you just point at something and you seem to make it happen. I know it's a lot of hard it, work. You I, make it look easy. I don't, I don't want to say that, that that's me. I think anybody that has a drive can find the way. Right. Hungary is a great place to do business because of its location, because of the, 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 the people here are naturally driven. Coming from a smaller country, coming from a post-communistic country, you have to fight. Right. Everybody fights. Yeah. And everybody pushes to move forward. And there's lots of entrepreneurs. There's lots of people that have a lot of drive. And, and so, yes, you can definitely make your way here. Apart from the, the background bureaucracy, of of building a business which which happens everywhere right some people say that i don't like this well okay that's a little bit cheaper here but it's this is a little bit more expensive over there so mm -hmm. i think that everything equals itself out i think if you have a good idea and you have a good plan and you have the drive then anything is possible anywhere you go anywhere you go yeah uh it just budapest happens to be in a very fortuitous position being central eastern europe it's not too east not too west right not too white not too black right. uh, uh and we're not talking about the color of skin. No, no. We're, we're talking about the 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 way that things happen uh the the the, the policies the laws right. the being in sales you know you, you work in the gray it, 100%. it's you, you never want to lie and and but but telling the full truth that that you know this was like this and this was like mm. this, then then th that also isn't really the the most. I don't know. It's thing. a great explanation, Nick, because nothing in life is binary, is it? Nothing is a one or a zero. The truth is always in the middle. Yeah, the a, solution is always in the middle. And I love the way that you describe hungry as being that in the middle. It it, it really is totally in the middle. Yeah. 
Um, but even when it comes to the people, the people, they're, they're, they're not overly friendly. I lived in America and, mm -hmm. and I, I found that uh, th that maybe coming from Europe was a little bit too much for me. But it's not the, the stone cold, I don't care about what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they're, they're not super closed off or anything. Right. They, I walk around with a smile on my face and I'm always reciprocated with a smile. Right. I always get that back. Yeah. I have good humor, they give me good humor back. The relationships that I've been able to develop here are probably some of the best that I've ever had. It's part and partial because a lot of the people that I'm meeting are also uh, are also foreigners, and we have this this common thing. But I have a lot of Hungarian friends, right? And my Hungarian friends have have consistently been more loyal than than a lot of the other friends that I've had around the world, where where. I, I'm assuming because Hungary is small and it's easy to move out of here, then lots of their friends are moving to Germany and coming back and moving to, to the UK and coming back in France and, and just everything that's around. Because anytime you have an opportunity to go somewhere, go. Right. It's, to me, it's not even a question. There's a lot of people like, what if I fail? But th there's no such thing as failure. Right. Or what are your metrics? Is it simply financial? Well, yeah, sure, it's a possibility that you fail financially, but you're coming back with a whole bunch of experience, yeah. wisdom, and, and measurement. A measurement of success is so different, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, percent. And, yeah. and and Hungary is definitely one of these places that that you can you know toss whatever to the wind, and and the standard of living is great. Yeah. Um, you know the pandemic didn't really help, right. uh, it, but it, it made things more expensive everywhere. So mm -hmm. uh, with that in mind, I've always, as a foreigner, as a Hungarian, because I don't live my life as a foreigner in Hungary. I live my life as a Hungarian in Hungary, because that's the way that you should live your life whenever mm -hmm. you move somewhere else. It, it's not that I am Canadian, so that I'm going to be better than, than everything else. No, Canadian is just something that's a part of me. Right. You cannot move into a place and assume that, that success is, is just going to be given to you or handed to you because you are not from there. Mm -hmm. But any original idea and anything uh, th that, <clears throat> that can be brought to market for whatever reason, whether it be service or whether it be a product, uh, it just happens to be a great place, a fun place. Nick, if you could, you know, <laughs> you are truly a relationship development guy. You say you're into sales. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. You can feel a passion in your voice. You can see it in your eyes as you talk about everything that you do and, and hungry is no different. If you had to give an 11 second elevator pitch on hungry, and, and to explain to somebody the importance of hungry, the importance of coming here, touching it and feeling it and understanding what this place is about, what, what would it look like to you? What would that be? If you and I were going up on an elevator and we had to do a deal, there's something <laughs> tells me that you'd make the deal happen. <laughs> um, that uh, Hungary is the closest to perfection uh, that I could imagine for a city to move to. It, if we take the three sister cities, which would be Budapest, Vienna, and Prague, it's warming, it's friendly, it's more livable. There are things that uh, can happen here and that you can do here that won't necessarily happen in the other two sister cities. Um, it, it is so centralized. It has a lot of access. The developments that are happening here are just milestone after milestone after milestone. And, and politics aside, because that'll be everywhere, if you look at the way that, that, that Budapest and Hungary has been developing after, after, over the last two, three decades, it's been, it's been really leaps and bounds, leaps and bounds. Vienna is a great place, but it's been fairly stagnant. They have great business, they have great everything. It's also expensive to live. Prague, also great, 
slightly different type of city. Um, I think that uh, it, it's a little bit brighter here. The, the, the feeling, uh, possibly the people, uh, the architecture is gorgeous. The, the food is great. Um, it just puts a smile on my face. That's how you close That's the deal, <laughs> right there. What do you think, Judith? Well, I'm all inspired and all pumped up. And uh, thank you so much for this. You you taking us on your journey, and uh, I'm amazed by this mixed identity of Filipino and and Canadian and Hungarian. It's just fantastic to see how how rich your background is. Wow. From the subdivisions of Aurora into King City through uh, an initial visit here to Hungary or returning home, I guess, if you will, into Alberta, back home again. What a journey you've had. What an outlook you have on life. What a passion you have for life. I, I wish you so much success. Thank you for allowing us into your story uh, on Gale Force Winds. It's very, very inspirational. I, you probably don't realize that the pieces of inspiration that you just dropped here today will find themselves to people around the world, and, and we really appreciate that. What does the world need more of? More Nick Tonellis. There you go. If that's the least that I've done, then it was a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Well done. Good job. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Gale Force Winds. That's Gale Force Winds, W-I-N-S dot com.